Okay, I think we can uh, get started now. I think we'll probably be accumulating a few additional people. But um, so a few weeks ago, some of you will remember, we had uh, Mark Zoback here who talked a little bit about technical as aspects of fracking and what happens when gas flows out of the ground. It was a little bit more technical than we were expecting, actually, um, but interesting. Uh, today, Dan Schrag has come out from Massachusetts to uh, talk to us on a little bit different um, uh, angle on, on shale gas. So let me tell you a little bit about Dan. He's currently the Sturgis Hooper Professor of Geology and Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering at Harvard. And he's also the director of the Harvard University Center for, Env for the Environment. Uh, Dan, uh, as a scientist, as a geologist and geochemist and uh, earth scientist, studies climate and climate change. And his interests span from early in Earth's history all the way up to very recent climate change. And in particular, he's well known for his work on the snowball Earth hypothesis, which was uh, snowball Earth refers to a time period about 700 million years ago when many believed that the entire Earth froze over. And uh, Dan, because of his knowledge of the carbon cycle, has contributed in major ways to understanding how that could happen and also how you can come back from that state. So Dan um, was a graduate student here at Berkeley. He was an undergrad at Yale, came here to Berkeley, um, and got his PhD in the Earth and Planetary Science Department in 1993. He then went on to be uh, an assistant professor at Princeton. He left Princeton in 1997 to go to Harvard, and he's been at Harvard since 1997. In, in 2000, he was named a MacArthur Fellow. And um, in 2009, he was appointed by President Obama to the Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and he's still currently on PCAST and, in fact, working diligently in real time on uh, policy statements about uh, regarding what the Obama administration is going to do with science, technology, and climate change in the second uh, um, term. So um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dan to you today, and he's going to talk to us about the question that we're, is on many people's minds at the moment, just what are we getting into when, with shale gas? Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Don. So thank you, Don. I, I should make it very clear to those of you who think from Don's statement that I am in any way deciding what the administration is going to do on science and technology that uh, uh, what I'm really struggling with right now is presenting some options such that the administration might um, decide what to do on science and technology in the second term. But it's not at all clear that we have um, a lot of authority in that regard. Although I've got to say the president has been remarkably committed to science and technology in general in a very difficult time. We'll see if that continues. Um, so it's nice to be back at, I, I still call it LBL. Um, uh, I used to walk through this hallway all the time because I would take the bus up the hill and then walk through here and the lab was over, my, my lab, which was Don's lab, was over on in building 70A and it was a time when, when I was up here originally, there was nobody on that floor. It was like an abandoned second floor of that building and the only person there was Glenn Seaborg who would, whose office was there and he would walk, he would get exercise by going up and down the stairs at lunchtime. So I would always see Professor Seaborg there. Um, so it's nice to be back. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a simple question. Is shale gas good for climate change? And the reason I think this is really important is that um, shale gas and natural gas in general has been really pushed on uh, by its proponents, partly because of the carbon benefits. You know, just simply relative to coal, it is half the carbon per unit energy um, and therefore has a serious environmental benefits and the question of, of how much should we embrace the shale gas boom um, comes from its climate benefits, I think. Um, I want to start with a, with a cartoon. This is an old one. Uh, this is from Vanity Fair from 1861. Um, and it just is there to remind me and maybe you that energy transitions are always full of interesting perspectives and that there are many different ways of viewing any one particular technological transition. This is, of course, the, the whales celebrating at the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania in 1861. And it is true that, in fact, you could argue that the whales were saved by the discovery of petroleum because it did displace whale oil. 
Um, it's hard to imagine that we actually got oil from whales at one point, but it's true. Um, and they were clearly happy at, at those oil wells in Pennsylvania. More recent events uh, made people in Pennsylvania a little less happy about those wells. Um, Mark Zoback has been here and talked about shale gas. I want to just make sure everybody's on the same page here. When we talk about shale gas, what we're talking about really is sort of a broader class of unconventional gas, or we could call it tight gas, which essentially involves two technological innovations. So conventional gas, you basically have a source rock, generally an organic rich sediment, often a shale for geological reasons. Um, that's where the organic matter tends to be, that matures, produces hydrocarbons, they migrate into a reservoir. Not always, but often that reservoir tends to be a permeable sandstone, sealed by some other impermeable rock, generally a shale. And conventional gas is basically about drilling a well, putting a straw in the hole, and sucking out the gas. In an unconventional gas or tight gas deposit, what you're talking about is the really the development of two technologies. One, horizontal drilling that allows you to drill horizontally into the, to the formation um, with incredible accuracy. Now two kilometer horizontal wells are not unheard of and, and they're also cheaper, which is really important. And second, then you hydraulically fracture the well to increase the permeability. We've always known that there was a lot of hydrocarbons here, both gas and some heavier liquids, but um, uh, getting at them effectively was always the problem. And really with the, with the combination of the cheaper drilling and better hydraulic fracturing and technologies that keep that permeability um, there for a long enough while you're able to suck the gas out, that's really the, the technology that's led to the shale gas boom. And I think it's important to see that as a broader set of unconventional gas that includes um, shale gas but also tight um, gas in sandstones that might be cemented for something like limestone and of course also cold bed methane as well, which has been a big success. And here's a DOE um, from the Energy Information Agency, a nice picture of all of the shale gas plays in the US. Not all of these are economic, um, and they all have different characteristics. Some of them have liquids associated with them, some of them don't. That makes a big deal today in times of low gas prices and high oil prices. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, uh, you get a sense of what things are. And, and I think it's fair to say that this shale gas boom, and I would connect the shale oil boom, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, along with it, as, as probably the greatest revolution in energy in the US for the last several decades. It's a really big deal. And this just gives a sense of how quickly it's come on. So you see, back in 2000, there was essentially zero contribution of shale gas to natural gas production in the US. And the outlook for natural gas was almost scarier than for oil in terms of peaking production. We were anticipating massive uh, imports of liquid natural gas, liquefied natural gas, and uh, more dependence on places like Qatar and Russia. Um, and instead, this boom has really been remarkable. Um, by 2012, we're almost at t 7 trillion cubic feet per year. And you could see for the first several years, really through 2007 or so, most of this was in Texas. Most of this was the Barnett formation in Texas. Right? This was really um, uh, a Texas-dominated industry. When we started to hear all of the pushback about the environmental consequences of shale gas, it really happened as shale gas migrated out of Texas, and we started to exploit things. Well, this is the Haynesville in Louisiana and Texas, but, but really the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, this tiny little light blue part here, um, that created a huge amount of of political pushback, even though it represented a very small fraction of the total shale gas. Um, it's important to note that this horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, as gas prices fell, got transferred to the oil industry. And the other big news in the energy sector, which is really connected to the same revolution in technology, comes from these two curves. This is oil production in Texas and North Dakota from 1985 through 2012. And you can see we've gone up to about 700,000 barrels a day in North Dakota. North Dakota has now passed Alaska in total oil production. It's incredible, really quickly. Even more incredible is Texas, which actually has increased production more than North Dakota. And this is also from tight oil deposits, mostly in the Permian Basin. Um, so 
this unconventional oil has been an enormous boom, and it will continue to be a source of economic growth for the US in a very important way. Um, so if you look at this overall, and, and I'm not going to talk much about shale oil today. That's a very interesting separate discussion. But I want to talk about the environmental consequences, in particular the climate consequences of this shale gas boom. And what's interesting is early on there were a lot of people who, who kind of set the terms of this debate. Here was a Financial Times article back in, 19, in 2009. So this is now um, three and a half years ago. This is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Jr. And he wrote this article about how to end America's deadly coal addiction. He was focused on coal, and he saw shale gas as the answer to that. So um, he says, converting rapidly from coal-generated gener energy to gas is President Barack Obama's most obvious first steps towards saving our planet and jump-starting our economy. A revolution in natural gas production over the past two years, it actually was over the past seven or eight years, um, has left America awash with natural gas and has made it possible to eliminate most of our dependence on deadly destructive coal practically overnight and without the expense of building new power plants. You can read this in detail. It's easy to find on the web. By the way, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. later on published a retraction of this saying he changed his mind and thought that the environmental harms of this technology were worse and, and he wasn't so happy with it. But I think this last statement is where a lot of people are, um, that natural gas comes with its own set of environmental caveats. It is a carbon-based fuel, and its extraction from shale, the most significant new source, if not managed carefully, can have serious water, land use, and wildlife impacts, especially in the hands of irresponsible producers and lax regulators. But those impacts can be mitigated by careful regulation and are dwarfed by the disaster of coal. So, there it is, almost four years ago, you see already this being set up as a gas versus coal debate. Um, of course, there were other people from the very beginning very critical of this, especially as gas moved into Pennsylvania and the Marcellus region. I don't know how many people have seen this documentary. I actually showed it to my class the other day. Um, it's a very scary documentary. If you, if you watch it, you will, you know, it has some great scenes of people turning on their tap water and lighting it on fire. Um, and there are real environmental consequences associated with this. We'll come back to this. Um, so there was already this debate, and this was in some ways a debate within the environmental community about which, which scale of environmental consequence do you care about. Climate change, which has a global footprint, and so do you care about the benefits of gas versus coal? Do you care about the bad parts of coal, which is air pollution? I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Or do you care about the local impacts of drilling and the possible contamination of local groundwater, which are all very local issues. And that, that tension is going to be a recurrent theme here. Um, but even on the climate issue, there was, a, there was some discussion. Um, I think the, the perspective that you hear from Department of Energy, from Steve Chu, and from his commission that he appointed that John Deutsch chaired, was that the carbon benefits relative to coal were substantial and warranted an attempt to try to clean up these environmental impacts that Gasland was talking about. Um, in order to reap the climate benefits of, of natural gas relative to coal. Um, a little while later, this is in 2011, Rob Howarth, who's an ecologist at Cornell, published this paper, which essentially questioned the whole underpinnings of the idea that gas was actually better than coal. Their argument in a nutshell was that the emissions of methane, which is also a greenhouse gas, more powerful than carbon dioxide, that the additional emissions of methane from natural gas drilling, especially, he argued, the hydraulic fracturing and production of shale gas, had additional um, methane leakage such that the total impacts when you looked at it were actually greater than coal. So it was worse than coal for climate change. And this confused a lot of people. A lot of companies said, oh my goodness, we thought gas was good, now maybe gas is bad. We don't know what's going on. What I'm going to try to show you is that the sort of, I would say, the dominant paradigm that gas is good because it's better than coal, and this perspective that gas is worse than coal are both wrong for the same reason, ironically. And that, in fact, we have to look at the impact on climate in a very different way. And that's the argument I'm going to try to make. I'm going to ask a very simple question. Is shale gas good for climate change? What are the greenhouse gas implications of increased shale gas production in the US? And I want to start with a scientific perspective. I want to move to a, a slightly 
economic perspective, talking about the prices of, of energy, and then I want to talk about the politics, which is, I think, really at the heart of the matter here. Um, I know that many of you are very familiar with this, but some of you may be a little further away from the problem of dealing with climate. Let me just tell you, as a climate scientist who's worked on energy technology and policy for a while, I just want to remind you a little bit about, about the way I see the world. Um, there are three ways to reduce CO2 emissions, very simply. One of them is, of course, to use less energy, which means efficiency and or conservation. Second, non-fossil energy, which means renewables and or nuclear. Um, and the third is using fossil energy, or biomass in, that, in some cases, and capturing the CO2 before it goes to the air and injecting it into a geological formation. Um, if you do scenarios of a low carbon world, I'm fairly convinced that you actually need all three of these, at least over the next century. Um, and uh, there's a, a lot of interesting work to be done with those scenarios to sort of demonstrate that. To me, the question of exactly how much each is going to play in a future world depends on many things that we can't predict in 2012, and in some ways is the wrong argument. In 2012, when we need to really be pushing on all of these, it's, it's sort of a silly thing to say, how much is each one going to be in a share of the future? Um, from a climate perspective, carbon dioxide is still going up. When I was here in graduate school and working up here at the lab, um, I learned that carbon dioxide was 350 parts per million. It wasn't that long ago. When I moved to Princeton and started teaching for the first time, I upped that number to 360 parts per million. In 97, so 97 is here, when I moved to Harvard, I started teaching courses and saying it was around 370 parts per million. It was a little shy of that. And then a few years ago, I was teaching a class and I was about to say 370 parts per million. I was using an old slide. And I realized that I'd passed 380 and gone right to 390. And now we're very close to 400 parts per million. In fact, we will probably hit 400 in Mauna Loa, Hawaii. That's where this record comes from. Um, probably not next calendar year, but probably the spring of the year after. There's nothing magical about 400 parts per million. But I tell you, as a geologist, I view this curve in a different way, and I think it's the way we all should see it. I think about it in this context. This is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now over the last 650,000 years. This is reconstructed from bubbles and ice cores from Antarctica. And you can see fluctuations. Some of these look fast. So for example, this last one, this is 20,000 years ago. This is the deglaciation from the last glacial maximum when, when CO2 was about 180 parts per million, and the pre-industrial level about 280 parts per million. And it looks fast, but that's because this time scale is so long. This transition actually took 10,000 years. Okay, and over the last 100 years or so, we are now at about there, about 395 parts per million. And that happened in 100 years, so it happened 100 times faster. And rate is really important. If this were occurring over 10,000 years, it wouldn't be such a big deal. It's all about rate. Um, by the way, over the next 40 years or so, we will be at around 500 parts per million. There is no question about that. That's built into the system. The question is not, will we get to 500? The question is, will we stop at 500 or 550 or 600? Or will we go shooting beyond it out to 800, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 parts per million? That's really the question in front of us. But I think it's important geologically to realize that we have never been above 300 parts per million in the last 650,000 years. Now, actually, we've extended this record back to about 800,000 years. And indirectly, we can say that we haven't been as high as, say, 500 parts per million, probably for t several million years, in fact, if not for 35 million years. So this is an experiment we're doing on the planet that hasn't been done for a very long time. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty here. But we actually know a fair amount about the carbon cycle. And, and there's a couple of things I want to mention before we go back to shale gas about the nature of the climate problem that is important for, I think, everybody to understand. One is the time scale of climate change. This is from a nice paper that David Archer at Chicago wrote. And I think he has, there's some very important lessons here that everybody should know. And, and I think, unfortunately, too many people are not aware of this. This is the long tail of the climate problem. What this shows is just a cartoon showing that you know, CO2, when we release it from burning fossil fuel, turns out about half of it leaves right away. About half of it is taken up by 
by the ocean and by the land. About a quarter goes into the ocean, and about a quarter goes into the growth of trees. So the Earth system is actually buffering. Uh, it's giving us a little bit of a cushion. We're not actually paying the full impact for all of the CO2 we put in the air. There's a concern that those sinks are not keeping up with the growth in emissions, and that's likely to be true. And in fact, it's possible that the terrestrial biosphere may turn into a source instead of a sink, and that's an interesting discussion. But um, let's save that for another day. This is just a schematic showing that if we continue to burn fossil fuel over the next 100 years or 200 years, about half of it will go in the air, and then the rest of it, it'll, it'll drop down to maybe 25 or 30 percent um, over the next several thousand years because of essentially the uptake by the ocean. The ocean is vast and has lots of carbon, as, as bicarbonate mostly, and it's limited by the mixing of the ocean, by mixing of surface waters into the deep ocean. That mixing is probably going to be inhibited slightly by the rapid warming of the surface ocean, which is going to stratify the ocean, but is limited by things like the rotation of the earth and the winds and the tides. And so we can't really speed that process up too much. Um, but in a few thousand years, there'll still be about 25% of the CO2 remaining. Reacting that carbon dioxide will acidify seawater and it'll actually react with calcium carbonate on the ocean floor. And the result of those chemical reactions will result in a little bit of additional uptake. But there's going to be something left, and it depends on how much we put in, but something like 10 to 20% of the CO2 we put in the air, or a better way, since we start off with only half remaining in the air, it's as much as a third of what we experience each year, will actually still be there and only be taken out by very slow processes associated with silicate weathering over tens of thousands of years. So to think about it, something like 10 to 20% of the CO2 we put in the air will still be there 20,000 years from now. It's something that often gets lost in this message. So it's a very difficult challenge for how to deal with this. There's one other thing about the carbon cycle that, and, and the climate response that's often not, not clearly understood, and that is that what really matters to the climate system is cumulative emissions of greenhouse gases. If you do experiments with climate models and you run different scenarios for emissions trajectories over the next 100 years, so different pathways but all have the same cumulative emissions over those 100 years, you get remarkably similar climate responses. It's not to say there is no differences between these, but it's remarkably insensitive to uh, different trajectories of emissions. This is a nice paper that Miles Allen wrote in Nature um, several years ago. This is 2009, where he talks about this, and several other studies have confirmed this, and a National Academy study echoed these just a, a year or two ago. Um, this is a much bigger deal than people have realized, because the reason is that climate policy generally focuses as the, the key variable being carbon emissions. We care about whether we can reduce emissions by 20% by 2030 or 2020, and that being the goal. The climate system actually doesn't care. It doesn't care about targets and timetables. The only target it really cares about is zero, zero emissions. And it needs to get there as quickly as possible. And whenever we do get there, it probably won't be quick enough. But it cares about the cumulative emissions during that time. And that means that intermediate steps, obviously, you have to go through a 20% reduction to get to zero. But it's not a very good metric, metric of progress. There are plenty of ways of getting a 20% reduction that actually don't help you get to zero, that actually get you hung up around 20 or 30%. And that's what's often missed. Um, I'll give you a nice example of this, and this has been a study, this is the famous uh, Wedges paper that Steve Pakala and Rob Sokolow wrote in 2004. It was a review paper in science, and they proposed this concept, which I think has been wonderful because it has helped people to think about what is needed to deal with low energy, tech, low carbon technologies. But I actually really object to the framing of the problem here, solving the climate problem for the next 50 years. And there's a confusion here. Humanity already possesses the fundamental, this is an incredibly uplifting, optimistic paper if you read it. Humans already, humanity already possesses the fundamental scientific, technical, and industrial know-how to solve the carbon and climate problem for the next half century. A portfolio of technologies now exists to meet the world's energy needs 
over the next 50 years and limit atmospheric CO2 to a trajectory that avoids a doubling of pre-industrial concentration. Well, the problem with this concept is that, that there are all sorts of strategies in here that actually don't necessarily help you get to zero. For example, fuel switching of gas for coal. And we'll come back to this. But it's very fundamental that ultimately what matters is getting to zero. And you have to ask the question, how does a step like switching gas for coal relate to ultimately getting to a true low carbon economy? That's the metric that counts. So there's a couple of things that are really important. I don't want you to take away from this. This doesn't mean you can delay emissions reduction until the end of the century. It doesn't mean that it's OK to say, well, it's cumulative emissions, so I don't have to do anything until the end, and then I'll just you know, suck it up. Uh, it doesn't work that way, because early emissions reductions, we don't know how much the cumulative emissions are going to be. right? So you need to do everything you can now, because that will ultimately potentially make the cumulative emissions lower. Um, OK, so, so the point is, climate cares about cumulative emissions. and and by the way, right there, you can understand why this is such a difficult problem. The time scales of the carbon cycle and the climate system with the inertia in the system are such that we are asking people today, over the next few decades, right here in California, for example, to make sacrifices that will have essentially negligible impact on your climate experience over the next 20 to 30 years. If you look at model scenarios, over the next 30 to 60 years, you'll see a mild impact on what you will experience if you made emissions reductions today. And over the latter half of the latter third of the century, it would actually really make a difference. But the point is, that's a tough political sell. Making people make sacrifices and pay money today for something that in most of our lifetimes we won't actually experience. Sometimes um, environmental groups are a little bit soft on this. And it's tough, because it does make it politically difficult. But I think we have to be honest about that. It is why this is so hard. The goal has to be zero emissions. And this is really a fundamental point. Annual emissions are not a good measure of progress towards that goal. OK. So what's the value of delay? As soon as we start talking about shale gas and coal, and Rob Howarth's argument about natural gas and methane leakage to the atmosphere, we're suddenly comparing different greenhouse gases. And this is a really interesting question. Um, and often the way this is done is something called a GWP, or a global warming potential. It's a terrible term, because the way global warming potential is actually defined has nothing to do with global warming. It's actually, it's, rate, it's, it's, it's essentially a, an integration of its radiative forcing. It's not the actual temperature response. So it's actually not the warming. It's just the integration of the radiative forcing. And what that means is, essentially, you choose a number. So a GWP for 100 years, so the GWP 100 is sort of the classic one that's used to compare greenhouse gases. Um, uh, for nitrous oxide, that number is 300. For, the, for, for methane, it's 25. This is all relative to CO2. So essentially, it's saying a kilogram emission of methane relative to a kilogram of CO2, what is its radiative impact over 100 years? Now, you think they could do molar amounts instead of kilograms, but they didn't do it that way. So it's stuck. It's going to be kilogram of methane emission versus kilogram of CO2. And the answer is, if you look at 100 years, it's 25. The reason is that methane is a powerful greenhouse gas, but it only has an atmospheric lifetime of about 10 years. And so it declines very quickly. And so if you compare it to CO2 in its radiation, its effect on the Earth's radiation budget, it's about 25 after year 100. It's about eight after 500 years, it's about five after 1,000 years. Which one should you use? What time scale is important? Some economists have said, well, you should use a discount rate. But that's a whole other discussion about what the value of the future is. It's a serious discussion. Um, so, so anyway, that, that's, that's the, uh, the definition of global warming potential. And by the way, there's a whole literature on how to think about this. There's, there's uh, many, many papers. This is just one nice example of of global warming potential. There's also the global temperature potential, which is basically taking the gases, putting them in a climate model, and looking at the temperature response, which is a logical thing to do. Except now you have an added factor, which is the model dependence. I want to take you through a simple calculation just to show you the nature of this problem. 
because I think people have misunderstood this enormously. Because at the core of what Rob Howarth was arguing about methane emissions is he argued we should take a 20-year perspective rather than a 100-year, because a 20-year is the time scale over which we really care about impacts. Not sure that's completely true, but that's the argument he made. Let me show you what that leads to. So what I'm going to show you is a set of scenarios using a very simple climate model. Um, um, and again, I, I don't care about the accuracy of the climate response here. This is just an example to show you what the emissions lead to in terms of a temperature response. So here is two scenarios for methane. We have this is kind of a, a methane growth and then decline over the next couple hundred years. And then this, which is our low methane scenario, we just basically cut the top off of that peak. And what we did here was this is our CO2 emission. So in the place where we cut the methane off, we have our CO2 scenario. And in the other ones, we actually reduce the CO2 by different multipliers relative to the methane. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking the area between these two curves and reducing the CO2 by a different multiplier. So in this case, 25 times. We're counting the methane as 25 times the CO2. In this case, we're counting the methane as, um, or CO2 as 25 times the methane. This is, is as 18 times the methane. This is seven times the methane. Okay, so it's very simple. We're just saying, let's compare the actual climate response using different equivalences between methane and CO2 and see what we get. Okay, and here are the curves. And this is why it's difficult to figure this out. The benefit you get from methane over short time scales, you can see, is pretty hard to see. This yellow curve is actually a little bit below the others. But you know, the, <laughs> the overall rate of climate change is really dominated by the overall increase. Okay? And you can see over longer time scales, out at a century, you start to see big differences between the two. And so you say, OK, this is, this is not just a hypothetical. This is a real policy question. The EPA is actually worrying about this. How do you value methane? When a natural gas landfill, when a landfill that's emitting methane puts flaring in there and they invest in the technology to flare the gas and ultimately turn it into CO2, which reduces its climate impact, this is actually a source of carbon offsets under the European trading regime. How do you value it? Europeans say, 25 times the value of CO2. So if there's a $10 a ton price on CO2, a ton of methane is worth $250. That's the law. Well, if you look at 25, that's this. You can see that if you go past, I don't know, 60, 70 years, you can see that you're heavily overvaluing the, net, the methane relative to the CO2. Right? That if you actually valued the CO2 as 25 times the methane, you actually get a much deeper response. But again, what time scale do you use? All of these metrics use a fixed time scale. Let me give you another example of this. This is from a science paper from Drew Schindel, where he argued that you should focus on methane and black carbon in the, in the short term. And so here are different scenarios that he's run through a climate model. The green is the business as usual, the reference scenario. Um, the purple is the CO2 measures. And let's just look at the, the, the dash blue one, which is the methane measures. There's also the black carbon measures, which is another issue. But you can see that what he's talking about is over the next several years, this is the difference between these curves. Here's the CO2 measures, and here's the, the methane measures. And he argues, we really need to do both of these, because look how much warming you can abate if you do methane first. It's a nice idea, and it's very compelling. Notice that he cuts this graph off in 2070. I'll show you why he did that in a second. Here's the problem with this argument. First of all, what he's comparing is a 50% reduction in methane emissions compared to a very slow, mild decarbonization stabilization regime. So you're comparing apples and oranges here. You're doing a drastic reduction in methane with a milder reduction in carbon. But the bigger problem is if you actually take that same figure, which is here, and you zoom out, this is the difference. So here is the CO carbon dioxide measures, and here is the methane measures. If you really, it, it, 
if the, if the methane measures are free, it's great. But if there's any kind of trade-off, if you actually only have a certain amount of political will or a certain amount of economic capital to invest in the technology, you can see that you can end up with some really bad long-term consequences. Because methane looks good in the short term, but it gets really, really bad over time. Right? If you actually reduced methane in favor of CO2, you would gain a little climate benefit here, and you'd pay a price for tens of thousands of years. OK. So let's come back to the shale gas discussion. It is true that shale gas has reduced coal consumption in the US. Coal used to be about 50% of our electricity generation, and it's now closer to 40%. Gas has climbed from 20 to 25% up to, up to 40%. So it's actually, they've actually kind of met in the middle. And you can see that here a little bit. This really is last year when, when gas prices fell, you can see that this area here of natural gas has grown a little bit compared to this, and that coal has dropped a little bit in here. But it's a lot more subtle than people have thought. Let me show you the data in, in um, other ways. By the way, a lot of people say that US emissions, overall greenhouse gas emissions, which have dropped about five to 7% um, over the last uh, five years, People often say that that's because of shale gas displacing coal. That's actually not true. The biggest factor has actually been this, which is the drop in oil consumption. We've gone from about 20 and a half million barrels of oil a day down to 18 and a half million barrels a day. That is a very substantial drop. It's a huge impact, um, and it has, it, it's mostly responsible for what's going on. Let me show you just some, some data from the Energy Information Agency. This is residential US natural gas consumption, which is a big part. One of the things about when you talk about gas versus coal is that people are arguing about electricity. But electricity is only about a third of natural gas consumption in the US. We do a lot more than just electricity with gas. That's not true for coal. So you can see this is US natural gas residential consumption. You can see last winter was really warm. I never took my snow shovel out of the basement in Boston, which is incredible. And this contributed to the low gas prices in a big way. That drop was about 170,000, uh, uh, sorry, about 100, and, yeah, 170, uh, yeah, about 170,000 million cubic feet per month. So it's a, it's a pretty big drop. Um, here is industrial consumption, and you can see really fairly stable, maybe rising a little bit. And here is the increase in natural gas going to the electricity sector. Okay? But notice this increase is also about the same magnitude as the residential decrease. So if you actually then look at overall US natural gas total consumption, it actually hasn't gone up that much. Maybe a little bit if you look at this relative to this. It's, it has gone up a little bit, but it's pretty subtle. It's not like we've completely changed our natural gas consumption pattern which is the way it's sometimes talked about in the press. Here's the price of natural gas. And I think from an economic perspective, this is the biggest impact that we've seen from natural gas on our energy system. So if we look just a few years ago, natural gas prices were, in the wintertime, well above $10 a million BTU. Um, and Earlier this year, in March or April, they were down below $2. They were actually about $1.86 at the Henry Hub in Louisiana, which is amazing. And we're now up about $3.50. But essentially, historically, this period led to very high electricity prices in states like California that depended on natural gas. And that has had a huge impact on all our energy choices. So, is shale gas good for climate change? Well, there's no question that we've dropped coal consumption by the electricity sector. But here's the interesting thing. A short time scale coal drop over the last five years, it's hard to say that's a great climate victory. Most of that is completely reversible. That is, we're not shutting those coal plants down. Some of them we've closed, but a lot of them, they're still ready for business. 
if natural gas prices drifted over the next five years back up to six or seven dollars, we'd turn that coal plant on in a second. The coal industry is still alive and well in this country. The big impact, I would argue, of natural gas and low gas prices has been a reduced investment and deployment in renewable technologies in nuclear and carbon capture and storage. Five years ago, there were about 25 carbon capture and storage projects that were all competing for DOE funding. Today, there's three left. Future Gen is gone. I'm not sure it's technically gone, but it is gone. And there's really three left standing. One here in California in Bakersfield, one in Texas, and one in Mississippi that Southern Company is doing. Um, so that's a huge deal. Nuclear, John Rowe, the head of Exelon, largest operator of nuclear power in the country, has no interest in building nuclear power given current gas prices. Now, to me, I always think there's something funny here given the time scale. I mean, it's like people don't have a memory. They don't remember that this existed. Think about it. The first nuclear power plant, if we were to start building a few nuclear power plants now, they wouldn't actually be operational until about 2020. And so on this graph, you know, 2020 is way out here. You really think gas prices are going to be $3 in 2020? But the way the markets think about it, they're very conservative. And that's understandable. They're investing tens of billions of dollars. So they're not going to risk it. And at times of low gas, nobody wants to invest in nuclear power. That's the truth. And of course, um, there's another perspective that makes shale gas look dangerous, which is just the simple step back and think about it. We've essentially made more fossil hydrocarbons in play. We've said there are now more hydrocarbons from, from oil and gas that are accessible at a lower cost. And therefore, the probability that we're going to extract them and burn them and put the CO2 in the air is going to be higher. So from an overall cumulative carbon emissions perspective, you have to sort of say shale gas is probably bad for the climate system. It might result in a short-term decrease in coal use in the US, and there are lots of benefits of that. But in general, it's going to end up with more cumulative emissions over the next 100 years, and therefore it's going to be bad for climate, especially if we start doing this all over the world, which is very likely. But let me now reverse myself. I want to end by actually making an argument that shale gas could be fundamentally beneficial for the climate battle in the US and ultimately in the world. And that's by taking not a science perspective or an economic perspective, but taking a political perspective. Because ultimately, solving this problem involves a very difficult set of political circumstances. And there are many issues here, but let me just show you one. This is just a map of generation capacity in states by type of, of power. So you see coal, gas, nuclear, and hydro, electric. Um, this is, in some ways, a map of the battleground in the Senate over climate legislation. This is really where the rubber hits the road. OK, look at Wyoming, 94% coal. And by the way, it's not just the states that produce a lot of coal, like Wyoming and West Virginia and Kentucky, the coal states. You know, It's not just the coal mining states. It's also the coal consumption states. So the states here like, oh, how about Ohio? It's been in the news a little recently. Coal matters in Ohio. Romney tried to get people excited about coal in Ohio. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, 53% coal, OK? Now, California, this don't, don't take too much solace in this number, 1%. In fact, you get quite a bit of coal-fired power from Utah and Nevada so, um, from here. So, so you know, this doesn't count interstate transfers of electricity. If you did, these numbers would be a little different. I'm going to do something very simple. This was old. This, I should have updated this. But this is what the price of electricity was in 2008 state by state, which is incredible, right? Look at Wyoming, 5.7 cents a kilowatt hour. I live in Massachusetts, where we have 16 cents a kilowatt hour. New York State, Connecticut, 17.8 cents. New York State, 16.6 cents. Much higher, of course, in New York City. Um, California was high, not that high going to get higher. Um, but this is sort of a very interesting map, right? Now, let's imagine we took this and we just assumed that, and of course this is not going to happen, but let's say we assumed that the actual generation didn't change as we priced carbon 
And of course, that is the whole point of pricing carbon is you want people to make changes. But let's just say, what would the impact be instantly if we put a $30 a ton price on CO2? Let's suppose we put a carbon tax at that level. What would it be? And you can see from a percentage perspective, Massachusetts, electricity rates would go up 9%. California, only 6%. Wyoming, 50%. Now, of course, it's 50% of 5.7 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's hard to feel too bad for them. But at the same time, this is where the politics are. Right? A price on carbon affects states differently. And that's a really big deal. The other political aspect of this has to do with something else, which is the jobs impact of natural gas. And I'm not an economist, and so I just wanted to look at this kind of in a very simple empirical way, which is almost certainly wrong, but it's, it's interesting. I just want to show you some data. If you look at the National Bureau of Labor Statistics for jobs in the gas sector, you can't actually get natural gas separated from oil. They, glump, they clump oil and gas together. However, you can look at oil and gas production separately. So here in black is jobs in the oil and gas extraction from Texas. Here is gas production. Here is oil production. And I think it's pretty safe to say that the increase in jobs in Texas is mostly due to increased gas production. I think that's pretty compelling, right? Here's what it looks like in Wyoming, for example. So here's oil in Wyoming. Here's gas in Wyoming, and here's jobs in oil and gas in Wyoming. And you can do similar things from other states. Take an example of a classic coal state like Pennsylvania. So here is the value of oil and gas produced, oh, sorry, coal and gas produced in Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania is a coal state. And still, the amount of coal they mine is worth more than the amount of gas they produce. But here's the interesting thing. Here are jobs in coal and gas sectors in, in Pennsylvania. Even though gas is worth less, it actually employs more people. And so if you care about jobs, and right now in, the, in Washington, jobs is a very loaded term politically, it turns out that coal industry actually doesn't employ many people. What's so interesting about the politics of energy in this country is that the coal industry, which is remarkably tiny, does anyone know what the market cap of Peabody Coal, the largest coal company in the US is? keeps going down, down, down. It's actually lost a huge amount of money. But I think it's now hovering around $7 billion. That's less than ExxonMobil's quarterly profits. I'm serious. It's nothing. It's tiny. And yet, politically, the coal industry is incredibly powerful. They say the coal lobby has 40 votes in the Senate and can block any legislation. And it's mostly true. And it's the coal state Democrats as much as the Republican states. Here's what's interesting. Here are jobs in coal mining. This is back from 2008 by state. There are two states where it's large, West Virginia and Kentucky. And that's because they do underground mining, which is labor intensive. But everywhere else, it's tiny. Wyoming is the largest coal producing state in the country, fewer than 7,000 jobs. Here's what it looks like for the oil and gas sector. This is really amazing. This isn't even close. I mean, there's a couple of states, West Virginia and Kentucky, that really, where coal still matters a lot. But everywhere else, gas is dominant in terms of jobs. And yet, if you actually say the political power of gas versus coal, coal is much more powerful than gas. So I think there's actually an interesting argument to be made. And another way to say this is, how does a $30 a ton price on CO2, let's imagine that was the mechanism. And we could think of other policy mechanisms that are equivalent. But how does a price on carbon ultimately affect different parts of the energy sectors? And this, again, let's just think about the next two decades. I would say investment in solar and wind has increased. And that's a really good thing. And we're going to deploy more solar. I still think the technology the total impact has remained small. When I say remain small, I don't mean tiny. We need to grow solar and wind up to 10% of our energy system. That's a huge amount of work. We're nowhere near that right now. We're closer in California than the rest of the country. But the truth is, getting there would be a huge accomplishment. If we could get to 10% renewables in this country, that would be fabulous. We're not there yet. We're not even close. So let's get there. But let's 
step back and realize that that's still only 10% of the electricity sector. Nuclear has other obstacles in the next two decades. As I said, we would be lucky to build two new nuclear power plants in the next 10 years. I think it'll be more like 20. Um, oil is expensive per BTU, so this basically doesn't matter. Oil prices here, you know, changing oil prices by 27 cents a gallon, that's not going to fundamentally change your consumption patterns. Energy efficiency will be encouraged, especially in coal states. So Wyoming will go up to seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour, eight cents a kilowatt hour. Um, that's wonderful. Maybe they'll be a little more energy efficient. But there's no question the dominant price of a, of, of a tar carbon tax, the dominant impact of a carbon tax is going to be a competition between gas and coal in the power sector. You heavily penalize coal and you benefit natural gas. Renewables are helped along, we need that. And what this would result in is more investment in nuclear, more investment in solar and wind, more investment in carbon capture and storage. Penalize coal, but gas is the big winner. So here's the irony. After decades of paying climate deniers and skeptics to essentially lie about the climate problem, who's the big winner of climate legislation in this country? ExxonMobil, the largest producer of natural gas. Isn't that interesting? They've actually started to realize that. And they're, they're a little nervous still about working with environmentalists. Although, many of you take note that the Sierra Club got in trouble for taking money from Aubrey McClendon, the head of Chesapeake Gas, right? So the gas industry is actually funding environmentalists to fight the coal industry. The Sierra Club wanted, had to give some of that money back because they were embarrassed because they thought they compromised. I, my feeling is just the opposite. Let's actually encourage that battle. Politically, maybe this is actually the way to go. A path forward on climate change is actually an oil and gas friendly climate bill. So the idea here is simple. Why not use the economic power of the oil and gas industry to overcome the political power of the coal industry? Now, I'm not naive. I'm not in love with oil and gas. You know, and the problem is environmentalists really don't like the oil industry, and there's good reason for that. I have to be careful. I, I was using some terminology today that I think would be inappropriate to get out more publicly since this is being broadcast. <laughs> um, but let's just say, if you think of climate and decarbonization as a 100-year war, it may not be, if you're a general deciding your strategy for the war, you don't necessarily open up three fronts in the first battle, right? You don't start fighting coal and oil and gas all at once. Maybe an interesting strategy politically would be to focus on one sector using the political power of the other two, even though you know that someday you're going to be uh, at war down the road 30 years from now with the oil and gas industry. I would argue that right now we don't yet have the technology to completely displace petroleum out of our society. And so in some ways fighting them is a little bit pointless. Let's make sure that we actually invest in the technology that someday will displace oil, but let's kill the coal industry. And what I mean is not necessarily coal per se with advanced technology like carbon capture and storage, but dirty pulverized coal has got to go. Um, so does shale gas mean the end of coal? Will it substantially reduce coal emissions? Probably not, but again, carbon emissions are the wrong metric of progress. Um, so there's all sorts of benefits of CO2 at a price on CO2. CCS profitable, nuclear is plausible, renewals, renewables begin to share the market with fossil energy. All of those benefits come. But to me, the biggest thing is actually not just displacing a little bit of coal. I don't want to see a 10 or 20 percent drop in coal consumption in the U.S. I want to break the back of the coal lobby in the U.S. so we can actually get Congress to vote on real climate legislation. And that's the problem right now. We're not really seeing the politics and the money clearly enough. And frankly, there's other good reasons for this. And this partly means using EPA rules on sulfur and mercury. This is the classic Harvard Six Cities study that's almost 20 years old now. Some people aren't aware of this. It's amazing to me. So this is samples taken from six different cities across the US that had different levels of PM 2.5. And they calculated the change in life expectancy due to these, correcting for all of these factors. And the difference was about three years of life expectancy from the dirtiest city to the cleanest city. Now, three years doesn't sound like that much, 
but let's just put it in perspective. Three years is equivalent to curing all forms of cancer. Three years is what three decades of medical progress have gained for us. So three years is a lot, and that's what air pollution does. To put it in even more stark terms, and some people don't like the epidemiology and all of the corrections that are needed for this sort of thing, um, there's a beautiful study that was done in the late 80s. This is in the Utah Valley around Salt Lake City, where because of wintertime inversion of the atmosphere, you get local sources of pollution are very, very important to the air. And what you see here is um, what happened was there was a steel mill, a single steel mill that burned coal that was responsible for something like 30 or 40 percent of the local pollution measured in PM10, 10 micron particles. And so you can see what happened this winter of 86, 87, there was a labor dispute and they went, workers went on strike and the plant shut down for a winter. So this was kind of a natural experiment. And a worker who's now at Brigham Young named Pope did this beautiful study that everybody should know about where he just, it's very simple. This is the particles in the air during the winter when the steel mill shut down. You could see the PM10 drop. And these are hospital admissions for children for bronchitis and asthma. So these are respiratory diseases for children for age 0 to 17. That's stunning. Coal is really bad for you, the way we burn it today. Now, we all sort of know that, but like, we're talking about sick children. When we hear Politicians say we want to shut down the lights at the EPA. They're talking about getting rid of the regulations that reduce particles in the air. We didn't hear pushback saying, you want sick children in this country? Um, I, I think we need to be aware of this. And so the way I think about the climate problem, it really is a hundred year war. We have to think long term and strategically. And in the short term, it may be that the politically best option is to use the new financial power of the gas industry, as difficult as that alliance may be, to ultimately get rid of the coal industry and push this further down the road. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So if anyone has any questions, just wait for a mic. Oh. Testing. OK. So are you planning to share this strategy with the uh, gas and oil industry? I've talked about it. You know, um, one of the great fun things about being at Harvard is that there are a lot of, it's a great convening place. So we get talks from all sorts of people, leadership of oil industry, gas industry, nuclear industry, everyone, and I've spoken to many of them about this. Um, it's a little bit challenging, I'll tell you, and the reason is that the gas industry leaders I know from Oklahoma and Texas, they don't actually believe in climate change. Um, culturally, they don't. It's a very interesting ideology. Um, and so it's hard for them to see the benefit, but they, on the other hand, they're, they're, they've funded this Clean Skies initiative because they do think about the other benefits. Um, ultimately, politically, I would love people to talk about climate change and worry about climate change. But you know, right now, I actually think if we can close old coal plants, all the pulverized coal plants in this country because of sulfur and mercury, that's a wonderful thing. Now, it is possible you could retrofit those plants with scrubbers that would reduce the sulfur and mercury and not solve the carbon problem. And that would be a terrible waste of an investment. Um, and so you have to be careful about that. Um, I think the idea that the environmental groups and the oil and gas industry would actually work together to cooperate to attack the coal industry is naive. Um, they hate each other too much for good reason, both sides. Um, but at the same time, I think that fundamentally, in the short term, we both have the same target, and that's important. Yeah. Um, England has made a lot of progress on climate change legislation. And we have probably to thank Margaret Thatcher for that because she took on the coal industry for her own reasons and destroyed the English coal industry about 20 years ago. Um, the, I wanted you to think about the end of your strategy, though, which is that even if you kill the U.S. coal industry, and you and what, what does that take you in the sense that if you allow the U.S. to have climate legislation, unless you deal with the coal industry worldwide and deal with the technologies 
you know, from a carbon perspective, we're not really getting that far. I totally agree. And again, let's go back to what I said earlier about climate. For, by the way, don't give Margaret Thatcher too much credit. She got, as you said, rid of the coal industry for her own reasons. Moreover, when, Kyoto, when the Kyoto Treaty was negotiated, the UK agreed to a reduction that they'd already essentially achieved because it was a 1990 baseline that they, they negotiated in 1997. The Germans did the same thing with reunification, by the way. Um, so they got rid of all their dirty East German industry. Um, I think the answer is, let's go back to the big perspective. We have to get to a zero carbon economy, okay? And as we said, there are only three ways to do it. Not all of them, but many of them are going to involve new technologies. Right? We're going to need to, it, it, maybe not new technologies, but much cheaper existing technology. So we're going to have to make renewables cheaper. We're going to have to deal with the intermittency problem in energy storage. We're going to have to make nuclear competitive. We're going to have to uh, make carbon capture and storage more, more um, competitive in a variety of ways. All of those things, right? And we're going to have to come up with alternative transportation, perhaps electric cars, for example, which means fast charging batteries and a variety of other technologies. All of those things are going to be critical. And ultimately, it's not just going to be government investment in R&D that's going to get you there. It's got to be an economy-wide investment with industry paying a big part of the, of the, carrying a big part of the load. And so to me, by essentially, think about what happens if you kill, if you shut down pulverized coal plants in this country. In this article I wrote about this, I basically say, you know, it's interesting. Renewable sector and the natural gas sector want the same thing. They want higher gas prices. The gas industry hates low gas prices, right? They're getting starved. They would love to shut down the coal industry because there is no way, even with very aggressive natural gas drilling, that you could produce enough gas at $3 a million BTU to actually supply all of the electricity required by shutting down the coal industry. So if you shut down the coal industry, demand grows so quickly that we insure $6 to $10 gas prices for a very long time. Now, I got to say, as an economist, you might say, this is bad for our economy. Cheap gas is good for all sorts of reasons, right? So you've got to be a little careful about that. But we're talking about climate now, not general economic issues. And if we care about climate, high gas, because you kill the coal industry, will ultimately lead to investment in everything else. Take the example of solar photovoltaics. We are not yet at 10% across the country, or 20%, or whatever you think you can do without really seriously running into energy storage issues. It seems to me, right now, the price of solar has gone way down. It's under $100 a megawatt hour. And yet, it used to be, five years ago, that would have been grid parity. That would have been competitive with natural gas. Today, it's too expensive. Because the goalposts moved, because gas got so cheap. If we could have $6 gas, solar would be in the money. We would see a quick deployment of solar, and my guess is the prices would continue to drop on solar as you deployed that. So that's the sort of move you need, and I think that's what's so critical. Yeah? They have, a, they have a film. They want you to talk on mic so that, they, that other people can hear you. Just be patient. We'll Hi. Um, so it seems like this whole natural gas boom I can't see the light. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry yeah. um, it seems like this whole natural gas boom occurred during the recession um, in this country. Um, if the economy were to start picking up, do you think that would have a big impact on natural gas prices or um, on coal prices? Or basically, how would that relate to this story? Yeah, I, I, I think the natural gas, I think there are two things that matter. The recession is obviously a big deal. Um, uh, I think the other thing that's a big deal is last year's warm winter, which really had a big effect in natural gas prices. People forget that you know, we did have this incredible warm winter, which kept essentially, that's what lowered gas prices. And then the electricity industry sucked it back up, right? Because they displaced coal. So the warm winter in the, in, in the US was a very big factor there. Um, as the economy recovers, you could imagine gas prices going up. Um, and then coal might turn back on. Um, I suspect that there's enough cheap gas from shale still out there that you're going to see 
maybe not $3 gas, but you're going to see sub $5 gas for a long time unless you really start to do some other things. Now, there's a couple of other things that are going to happen over the next 10 years, which is you may see a, a fight over renewable of nuclear power. We have all these nuclear, we have 106 gigawatts of nuclear power in this country, and there's a fight in Vermont going on right now about whether you can renew the, the permit for the, for the reactor. And if they start turning some of those down, that will also increase the demand for extra electricity, and you'll see possibly gas prices drifting up for that as well. Yeah, sorry. So I think I agree with your fundamental argument that uh, we need higher energy prices. And I was wondering, though, this idea of a tax on carbon has been floating around for a really long time, and it's totally unpalatable in today's political climate. So with the eye toward um, achieving the goal of higher prices, I'm wondering if something more palatable would be more like a floor on the price of gas, just like we do for milk. and Gasoline. No, no, uh, natural gas. Because it seems to me that there is this real risk of prices going too low and shutting off investment in renewable technology development in the private sector, which has been, you know, pretty exciting recently. Yep. But if I think in the in the inter, you know in the short when you're taking this sort of short term battle for the long term war perspective, it seems like um, going after a carbon tax is not a winnable battle. So, so the idea of putting a floor on the price, a tax that comes in only um, if prices drop, is a, is an idea that's been around for a while. It's been mostly pushed in the gasoline in the petroleum sector. Um, here's the problem. There's a secret going on, which isn't that much of a secret, which is we actually need revenue. You know, this fiscal cliff coming up, the government desperately needs revenue. And I would say it's unlikely. And when I say unlikely, I think probably one in five chance. But there is real discussion among Republicans and Democrats in Congress right now that are exploring the idea of saying, well, if we don't raise income taxes and replace that revenue with a carbon tax, would that be a way of putting a carbon tax in. Now, it's regressive, right? If you, especially if you focus on income tax increases for high income and replace it with a carbon tax, it's a regressive tax. That makes Republicans happy, so maybe it's politically palatable. <laughs> um, I, I, the point is, um, I, again, I think because of the, the politics and money involved, that's a very unlikely outcome. But it's not impossible. There are discussions about it, and there is a chance that that will happen. Not because people like a carbon tax, but because they like it better than an income tax hike. Um, but we'll see. I think the odds of getting a floor put has never been palatable in Congress. And it doesn't provide the short-term revenue benefits. And that's really the problem. So politically, you know, when people vote for something, they want to, uh, people in Congress want to see some Something, voting for a tax increase of any sort is a very difficult vote in Congress right now. And so if you're going to do that, they want to see some benefit. So at least it should fund deficit reduction or an increase in some government program or making Social Security more safe or something. But to put in a vote for a tax that doesn't even give you any revenue in the short term, that's a tough political sell, I think. Um, how sustainable do you think the shale gas industry is going to be? Uh, at a recent um, presentation, uh, the speaker mentioned that the wells drop off in production very quickly, uh, from like 90 to 100 percent down to 10 percent within a few years. Yeah. So that's the decline curves, which is which is well known. A couple of things you can do: you can refract the wells, or you can drill additional wells. And so this is a drilling-intensive industry. Um, and so essentially. What it requires to flourish is higher gas prices. Essentially, the way this has survived during the last couple, few years has to do with the natural gas liquid. So essentially, natural gas has almost become a side product of natural gas liquids that are produced in the process. And you've actually seen this. Places like the Haynesville Formation in, in Louisiana, um, they're really not drilling there anymore. They're still producing some gas from those deposits, but they're not drilling there much anymore because it's very deep. It's deep and therefore hotter and dry. So essentially, you have no liquids there. It's all gas. And they can't pay for those deep wells with the gas. The gas prices are too low. 
I don't know what the break even for Haynesville is. It's probably around four or five dollars instead of three. But gas is at 350. You can't really make much money in drilling deep wells for dry gas. Now, in Texas, you get a lot of wet gas, where you're getting the liquids, and the liquids are selling at such a premium relative to the gas prices that essentially the liquid sale is covering your, your drilling costs, and the gas is like a waste product. I mean, if you take the extreme example in the Bakken Formation in North Dakota, the gas is literally a waste product. They don't even bother to build the pipeline. They just flare it. So they're producing oil out of the Bakken Formation, and they flare the gas because it's not even economic enough to build the pipeline. If you actually saw gas prices rise to $6, you'd probably build oil pipelines in the Bakken in North Dakota and actually get that gas to market. Right now, you're not doing that. Um, I have to go back to an earlier question because you did not answer the question. And that is, this is all good and great if the CO2, if the US was a nice little box which was isolated. But a, any of the things you said basically may not be realized in any possible way unless there is a global thing. Yep, that's and exactly right. the other thing that I'd like to point out on the global scale is that the only two places in the world where there is significant hydraulic fracturing activity right now is the US and Canada, nowhere else. This being the case, China has not even begun yet. Poland is on the verge. Ukraine is on the verge. So with this in mind, the fact that this is a global issue, how can we even talk about this uh, zero CO2 situation? Well, again, I think the important thing, and this is really the challenge. Uh, let, let me make sure I come back to the first thing, because I did miss that. In the old. But, but first, let me just say what you said at the end. The big challenge of the current president, any president of the United States right now, is to oversee this huge hydrocarbon boom in oil and gas, meanwhile investing in the long term to get you off oil and gas over the next 30 or 40 years. Right? And that's, the, that's the, in some ways, the, the paradox. Right? You want to encourage domestic oil and gas production, but you also want to invest in alternatives for disruptive technology to ultimately solve your addiction. Um, and that's a tightrope to walk that's very tricky. Now, you are correct. Uh, in Poland, they're starting to drill. They've had very mixed results, as you know, um, in terms of production of, of gas in Poland. Um, China, you know, you have $16 gas there. So it's incredibly profitable, but they haven't been able to get it to work yet. And they're going to start to do it. And then we'll see whether it works. There's no good geologic reason I can think of why North America should be so magical. But we'll see what happens as this spreads around the world. Um, and we are likely to see a big hydrocarbon boom, um, I would think, over the next several decades. Why is the US then so important if it's the whole globe that matters? I think the answer is technology innovation. Ultimately, ultimately, my view is that the public will support some level of externality, pricing of an externality. I don't know whether that's $10 a ton of CO2. $20 a ton, $30 a ton, but probably not much more than that. And that ultimately, low carbon technologies have to be directly competitive with fossil technologies. That's why shale gas is so tough, because it's essentially made hydrocarbons cheaper. right? But part of this is about investment and innovation. And cheap gas has killed that. I mean, think about four or five years ago. We were investing in all sorts of things. Clean tech was booming in the venture world. It's all dried up. And I think a large part of that is, can be blamed on cheap gas prices. Nobody has an appetite for investment in alternative energy when gas is at $3 a million BTU. So frankly, even $6 would solve a lot of that problem. And ultimately, I believe that the US is one of the countries where the sort of energy innovation that is ultimately needed to solve this problem for the world is likely to occur. It doesn't have to be here. And by the way, we need China's manufacturing because we don't do that manufacturing here. So there's a lot of other places that will play a role, other economies that will play a role in this. But in terms of the energy innovation and the technolo technological innovation, and speaking here at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, sort of, you know, this is one of the places where this has to occur. Ultimately, this problem is going to be solved by technolo technology and innovation. But we need to invest in that innovation. It's not just going to be government investment. It has to be government and industry investing together in a smart way. And, and low natural gas prices is really pulling the rug out from all of that. <laughs>
we'll, we'll take we'll take two more questions and then um, let people get on with their days. I can't see. Sorry. What What do you think the second Obama administration is going to do about a carbon tax? There are a lot of influential Republicans who are in favor of that. Uh, George Shultz, for example. Yeah. And, uh, Unfortunately, George Shultz isn't as influential as he once was. Yeah. Well, they much prefer that to more regulation. Yeah. And there could be some trade-off between regulations and... As I said, they prefer a carbon tax to EPA regulation, and EPA has passed rules for new stationary sources, and they're going to pass rules for existing stationary sources. That'll be tied up in the courts for probably a decade, but they will do it. Um, as I said, I think that that's being discussed in Washington now because they do prefer it to regulation. They do prefer it to income tax hikes. Um, but if you look at the opposition, if you look at the lobbying from coal state Democrats and Republicans from many states, that's what it takes in the Senate to stop anything from happening. So I think the odds are against it. I wish it would happen, but I think I'm, I'm I think my assessment isn't, un unfortunately, I don't think it's too wrong. It could happen. I think it's a real possibility. It's not zero, the chances that this happens. But I think it's unlikely. One more? OK, Hi, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, OK, it's on. Um, the f seemed like you made some points that were global and some that got less and less global, both in certainty and in, in scope. So the information about how important is it to worry about natural gas versus, say, coal emissions, it was really solid. Then probably next, the idea that if you have fracking, you may keep prices down as a negative thing or increase more fossil emissions globally, as we were hearing. Those seem more certain to me then that if you allow fracking to go forward, you get this benefit of pitting oil and gas against coal. And that also seems rather more US-centered. Both is. less certain and US-centered. So well, well, it doesn't me, seem like the strongest to... point of the chain to me. Well, I, I think what you're, what you're, as a scientist, you're tapping in on the uncertainty of politics versus the uncertainty of science. Mm -hmm. um, and let me be very clear. Exactly. There are scientific arguments here about the impact of methane versus CO2. There are economic arguments about what low-priced gas does to everything else in investment in energy systems. And then there's the political argument that I made at the end, which is really a US-centric argument because I actually think that ultimately we're, the world's not going to solve this problem without the US being maybe not leading the way altogether, but being a major leader in this. And I, I, I believe that. Now, it's possible that China will figure out the technology and we'll import Chinese technology, and that's how we'll solve the problem. So I know that's heresy sometimes. No, I think what I tried to say was actually the arguments that shale gas, the shale gas boom is good for climate because it displaces a little coal in the electricity sector, which is essentially what the Secretary of Energy's position has been, just I think doesn't stand up to scrutiny. It's not good. And yet, politically, gas could be very good in the US for ultimately solving climate. Those are in contradiction. That's the point. There are political benefits of gas. Overall, gas, figuring out how to extract hydrocarbons from the ground at a lower cost ultimately has to be bad for climate. But given that, that's that you know, Pandora's box is open. Now what do we do about it? Let's capitalize on that politically and actually try to solve this problem for the long term. That was great. Um, you've, allowed, you've given us an opportunity to potentially understand what's happening in the United States over the next 10 years. Because regardless of what they do, there's a, re there's a potential rationale for it. Anyway, this was a very stimulating talk, Dan. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.